Today I want to present you a DSP processor spec from 1994, the Dynacot DSP224. So maybe one of the first DSP processors which were ever out there in the market. But at first let me explain what this DSP processor was used for. So maybe you have been already in some uh, live sound clubs or on some concerts where you have seen big and large PA speakers. And uh, most of the systems are actually separated in some kind of mid-high tops and into some subwoofers. But the problem is basically that for like club music or even live sound music, like most of the overall system energy is flowing only into the subwoofers. I would assume, depending on the music, between 70 to 80% or something like this. And yeah, the other problem is if you have very, very high power amplifiers in the range of uh, some several of kilowatts, it's not possible anymore actually to make the frequency splits between the subwoofers and the mid-high tops with just passive crossovers. So the way to go was basically that you have an active crossover like a DSP processor or also like an analog processor splitting the frequency range already before the amps into like a subwoofer signal and into some mid-high signal and then actually amplifying the two signals with two separated amplifiers so that you can use a really high power amplifier for the subwoofers and like a, let's say lower power amplifier for the mid-high tops and this exactly was the task of this DSP processor and yeah as it, this device is extremely old we will have a look today what this device is capable of what you can do with it and how it is also constructed inside. At first, let's have a look on the top side of the housing of the DSP processor, which I have descrewed now that I can make a better movie of it. So basically, we have three operation modes of this DSP processor. So we have one time a stereo two-way configuration, we have a three-way uh, configuration plus one sub-chain, and we have a complete four-way configuration. So it's not only possible to make the frequency split between subwoofer and mid-high speakers, you can also like driving a full active three-way system with uh, one additional subwoofer, but actually this is then only, I guess, mono mode or something like this. So, but yeah, let's focus maybe just on the stereo two-way mode. So you see we have like two inputs here at this point. We have some analog gain control. We have an AD converter. Then we can adjust some delays here at this point. And we also have like a first peaking equalizer, which is directly uh, insert into the master signal, which is basically coming from your mis mixing desk. And then you see we have four outputs. So we have like two outputs for the left channel, which means left channel uh, low, which is a subwoofer, left channel high for the mid-high speaker, and the same stuff once again here for the right channel. And we basically have everything what we need basically. So we have once again two separated delays uh, between the subwoofers and the mid-high, which is basically good if you have like a big horn subwoofer and you want to make a time adjustment of your uh, mid-high speaker to the subwoofer. Then we have one time a high pass filter here and we have a low cut uh, at this point. Yeah, the high pass filter was basically like the switch over a frequency for the mid-high top. And now you maybe wonder why do we have a low cut here also for the subwoofer. Yeah, the thing is basically that if you have extremely low frequencies below 20 or 15 hertz or something like this, even big subwoofers can reproduce them. And therefore you want to save them um, before those uh, very, very deep frequencies are coming to the subwoofer, which can be reproduced anyway. So we have a low cut then, then we have a shelving equalizer, peaking EQ. Then we have the uh, low pass filler at this point, which is giving us the switch over frequency then to the high pass, uh, to the mid high speaker. We have some polarity control, output level adjustment, also some limiters that you can limit the output power of your amplifier so that the um, speaker is not destroyed in the end. And also we have some DA converters here, of course, then some analog output control and here um, on the right hand side, then really the outputs. But now let's have a look on the front side of the DSP. So here on the left side, we have an analog level adjustment before the ADCs basically um, to adjust the input level. Then we have here some level meters, two times for the input. You have a, a clip LED. Then we have like uh, level meters here for the output, like four times and some LEDs, which are showing if the limiters are active or not. And we have some control, a rotary encoder for the menu control and some analog level adjustments behind the DACs, but now let's switch it on.
Yeah, and this was the way how it worked. So here you have now a, a dedicated setting, which is now called Bell Monitor somewhat. Then you can select like other user programs. I don't know. Here we have something. F118 plus F1153. This is like a dinner cot system. And yeah, here you can press here like edit, and then we can just step through the menu. So this is like low cut frequency of the subwoofers. We have like um, the low cut response, so how deep should the low cut uh, be, or how steep should the low cut be. Um, we have some shelving frequency, then the, um, the gain of the uh, shelf, uh, shelving filter. Then we have the peeing equalizer. Then we have here the main low pass uh, frequency. Yeah, delay adjustment, polarity, limiters, high pass frequency. So basically everything what we have seen on the block diagram from the top cover of this uh, DSP in here. Now let's have a look on the back side of the DSP. So here on the right side, you can see we have like the two inputs which are coming from the uh, mixing consoles. You have here like the four outputs which are going then to the um, audio amplifiers and then to the speakers. And yeah, here on the left side, you can really see it's from 1994. So now already 26 years old, very impressive. What we can see here now is already more or less that what I have expected. So here on the upper left edge, we are having like our uh, input connectors. Here we are having our output connectors. This is the main power supply connector. And we are having here some input filters with a yeah, switch basically to turn it on and off. This is like our switch mode power supply. And we can also have a look at the voltages in here. So we have plus 15 volts and minus 15 volts going inside here for the analog domain. And we are having also plus five volts for all the digital stuff. Um, here on the left side, we can see now, this is our um, input connectors. Here we are having like some operational amplifiers, some one from Philips and also some from, yeah, I think those are all from Philips here in this case. Then we are having here a connector to the front side to make the analog audio adjustment. So you see, this is purely analog. And then very interesting, our ADC. I cannot remember when I have seen a package like this the last time. So this is an AD1879JD, very interesting. And also interesting, we have a serial um, audio interface. Actually, I have assumed that it still would be like a parallel um, uh, ADC interface, to be honest. Yeah, then this here, I guess this is the main audio processor, some old Motorola 56K stuff. And here you can see here we have like our output domain also like with some op amps in here, some from JRC, which is Japan Radio Corp and some Philips op amps. And also for this, you can see we have like here connectors, which can be volume controlled in here. So this is also like purely analog done. And yeah, basically the DAC is a PCM69AP from Boer Brown, which is now text instruments. And interestingly, those DACs are connected to some Sony IC, some, X, some CXD2560. To be honest, I don't know at the moment what those uh, Sony uh, ICs are doing, but I will look it up uh, later on. Yeah, then we have some here, some 74 logic stuff. I guess this is here some level shifting or something like this for driving the display here on the front and also like feedbacking the um, switches, push buttons here back to the mic controller. Yeah, and this I guess is the main microcontroller here um, for the display and all the system control. Siemens SAB8515. So actually I cannot remember when I have seen last time a Siemens microcontroller, to be honest. And then we have here a PAL, okay. And yeah, interestingly here is an EEPROM. So today you would not design something like this, like a microcontroller with a firmware on external chip or something like this, as you have like all the flash integrate nowadays. So something else interesting in here. Ah, here's the MIDI interface. Seems to be like it was an external board, which was maybe not designed by Dynacord, I don't know. Because also the silk screen is looking a little bit different. 
Here is a small battery holder to hold some data. Yeah, and this was it, I guess. So the ADC, this was an AD1879, uh, as I have shown you already in the video. I had a look in data sheet, so this is either a 16-bit or 18-bit Sigma Delta stereo ADC. So this means depending on the version, if you had like the 7.8 or 7.9, you either had like 16-bits or 18-bits. But uh, Dynacord obviously decided for the 18-bits ADC, which is a little bit better than 16-bits at least. And yeah, sampling rate was possible up to 55.8 kilohertz, but I guess most probably they were using like 44.1 or 84 kilohertz, but I didn't measure it with a scope. Yeah, and interestingly, as I have said already, there was no parallel interface, which I yeah didn't uh, expect before something like this. So there was really a serial interface and I had a look. Actually, it was not called I2S, but from the timing perspective, it really looks quite similar or actually it is somehow an I2S interface because you can also see that in here that you have like the toggling of the um, left right clock here, actually one clock cycle before actually the new frame starts with the MSB. So yeah. So uh, as next, let's have a look to the DAC, which was the PCM69AP. And this is also an 18-bit uh, DAC. So we are having here full 18-bit resolution, obviously, in the system, no 16-bits at least. And yeah, this is basically an, uh, a very, very simplistic DAC construction, obviously for, for audio applications, but also for other applications, I don't know. But interestingly was that the input sampling rate you are putting here into the, into the DAC was obviously, I haven't read it in detail, but I guess it was uh, more or less like the speed of uh, the uh, internal Delta Sigma regulators need a data stream. So this means that you need an external upsampling filter. And if you have a look into the data sheet, uh, there was also called digital filter interface and there was directly that circuit proposed with the Sony uh, CXD2551. So I guess uh, Dynacord just copied here the system proposal out of the data sheet in here. But now let's have a look once again to that Sony device. So especially the 2550 I didn't found uh, unfortunately, but the 2551, so I guess the devices are most probably similar. Yeah, and this is just a digital upsampling filter, uh, which you can set for upsampling by four or upsampling by eight. So um, you can come externally with a 48 uh, kilohertz uh, audio stream into it and you get an output of 384 kilohertz, for example, or yeah, not really 384, but yeah, depends basically if you have uh, by four or by eight multiplication in this case, but I guess they used by uh, eight. Yeah, the next thing is the DSP 56004. So for the XC um, 5604, I didn't find anything, unfortunately, uh, but at least it's a dedicated uh, audio DSP for 24 bits audio resolution. And it also had directly integrated the serial audio interface already. Yeah, and the Siemens mic controller, a very simplistic 8-bit mic controller, nothing special about it. Um, so you see here, mic controller with factory mask programmable ROM, interesting. Yeah, and I guess this was the overall system construction here. So you have an analog audio input, then you have the analog audio pre-processing, which we have seen with a lot of op amps external gain control and then you got your analog audio signal into the ADC I guess maybe with 48 kilohertz sampling rate but I'm not completely sure about it into the DSP and then we got an output stream here also maybe of 48 kilohertz then there was that upsampling filter so actually there's written by four but this is wrong I guess I think they maybe used by eight or something like this then getting with a very relatively high uh, sample rate out of this uh, Sony interpolation filter into the DAC and then we got here the analog uh, audio post processing also with external gain control and then you had your analog audio output and yeah I guess that like DSP and uh, Siemens mic controller were connected via serial interface I guess via UART or some parallel port I don't know exactly and this is doing then the LCD and like reading from the rotary and from the push buttons and maybe here was external memory connected also but I'm not completely sure how it was it was maybe like this 
I'm not so familiar with like extremely old device where you had like external EEPROM or stuff like this. So it could be also that I'm a little bit wrong here, but more or less somewhere in this direction it must have worked, I guess.